We just finished praying the katana. And the katana in the meeting is placed very, very deliberately to roughly be the hinge point of the meeting. But in a typical meeting, normally it comes after all the work reports have been done. The handbook is flexible on that, and it says, you know, if, there are, if there's a large presidium where the reporting takes a while, it can be broken by the katana, and then the reports resume on the backside after the alacusia. But typically, the work reports pour into the katana, and that is not accidental. In fact, it's very profound. On a side note, with all of these observations I'm making about the meeting, one of the reasons I'm explaining the meeting this way is not simply for the benefit of those Legion members who will be either in attendance here or will be viewing the videos of these conferences, but to give a model for what happens when you have potential new members coming. Because the Presidium meeting can seem mysterious to an outsider. There is nothing wrong, and it is not a violation of Legion protocol, and I want to stress this. If before we move to the next part of the meeting, the President or the Spiritual Director simply offer a couple words of explanation or orientation for the visitor, so that they have a sense of what it is we're doing and why it's important. It doesn't need to be a 10-minute speech. It shouldn't be. But a, but a couple sentences in terms of now we're moving toward and this is why we do that. It makes the meeting more accessible to a visitor if a new member begins to find his or her way into the system a lot easier. If we're just attentive to the fact, it also underscores the fact that we know what we're doing. As opposed to, well, we've always done it this way and I'm not sure why. Um, we always want to know why we do what we do, and to the extent that we can share it and explain it, that is always helpful. But the difference it makes when a visitor comes in, in terms of how welcome they feel, how easily they can identify with what's happening, the minute a simple statement just to explain the value is given, right away the door opens a lot more widely to a potential member. Um, work reporting. Whenever there are gatherings of Legion members, whether it's a local congress, whether it's a retreat, the minute the floor is open to general questions, at least 80% of the questions tend to deal with works. And there are a couple kinds of questions that come into this category. One, what is a real Legion work and what isn't? And two, what is a good report and what isn't? Um, and you know the bulk of the bulk of questions that one gets with regard to and from legionaries themselves um, about what we're doing and how we do it normally crystallize around that. Then there are the questions about the meeting and questions about organization. But for the most part, the heart of the questions and the bulk of the questions can cluster around the issue of the we don't have enough time in a 45-minute conference to deal with all of the potential issues. And mainly because I also want to move through the rest of the meeting details as well. But there are some things I want to emphasize that when we understand them, take a number of questions off the table, or they should. One, we mentioned that works are to be reported. And every member must give a report. And that is not optional. There is no option for a member who is present not to give a report. There is zero option for that. Now obviously if two members are sharing a work, one can do the bulk of the reporting, but the other shouldn't just be a silent partner. Um, there are those occasions where, for whatever reason, a member doesn't have a work to report. The member still gives a report. The report is very basic. I wasn't able to do a work this week, and this is why. No. It, because, again, we're accountable for the commitment. And if I haven't discharged the commitment, I simply explain it. And this is not to be received with judgment or criticism. 
Because sometimes we get sick. Sometimes a family member gets sick. Sometimes life gets away from us unexpectedly and the time that I had set aside to do my work isn't there. You know, so these things happen in the ordinary course of things. No one should feel guilty because I don't have a work this week. Okay? But the issue is simply that uh, we, should, we should be open and trusting enough around each other to be able to name it. So that's the issue. I'm accountable to you, you're accountable to me, we're all accountable to Our Lady. But the, is, you know, but the, but the insistence is every member should speak during the reporting phase. And if, if I've got nothing to report, I simply say it and I own it. And that's okay. Now, if it turns out to be 10 weeks in a row, <laughs> then that, that's, that's a matter for the president outside of the context of the meeting to say, you know, let's talk about what's going on. Is, uh, you know, uh, and just help us understand, like, will the situation correct itself? Um, you know, what needs to change so that you'll be able to? Um, but you know, we want to be sympathetic because, again, all of this is lived in the fragility of our real lives. And so as strongly as the handbook words certainly we always have to recognize that that strong wording must be lived in the fragile reality of our coming together. And we have to respect the fragility, but we also have to respect the strength of the commitment. And the, you know, the tricky thing is doing both. But the handbook insists, again, no one is allowed to be silent for the meeting unless he or she is a visitor. And so there are parts where all the members are expected to have something to say. The most prominent of those parts is the work report. Next then, work report happens because the work is not mine. I'm accountable to somebody else because I don't own it. Why do I report on work? Works are given to the Legion members. This is one of the areas in Legion life that over the years has been very problematic and one of the places where, without realizing what it was doing, the Legion allowed itself in many areas to be pulled off course. And it was done this way. In certain locations, Presidias are, you know, they're conscious of, we're getting older, we're losing members, we need to get more people in here. And looking around, trying to find good candidates, they find people who are already occupied and engaged in ministries in the parish. And we go to these people, we invite them to join the Legion, and they're hesitant because they're already doing so much. And the response is often, that's okay, you can just keep doing what you're already doing as your Legion work. And the minute that deal is made, that Presidium has wounded itself. Because the President no longer has the ability to assign work. And because the Presidium is simply surrendering to what everybody else in the parish is already doing, and is losing the ability to make a unique contribution to the life of the parish. Um, so we, we want to recognize that. And the minute, the minute I come into the Legion with I can keep doing what I'm already doing, nothing changes for me. And my membership in the Legion simply gives me another meeting to go to. You know, and so it really is important to catch the fact that in the Legion, works are assigned. We don't bring our pre-existing works in. Or if we do, we surrender them in order that we might receive them back. Uh, but it is very important to recognize that. Um, otherwise, we break that connection of accountability and flexibility, which is very important. And again, the ideal model in the Legion, it is not a universal requirement, but the ideal model is that we work in pairs or work in teams. It doesn't always have to be a pair. It could be three or four. Okay, but normally Legion work is not discharged regularly by myself. And so then when we give a report, I'm reporting on what I've done with somebody else. And know what's happening there. 
the reporting has the note of we're also accountable for the quality of our working together. That's important too. And note, that implies as well, I receive my partner for the work too, as well as the work. In other words, you're not married to your partner even if you are in fact married outside of the Legion meeting. <laughs> Legion partners are not permanent. And there is a real value, even if 90% of the time I work with this person, some percentage of the time I work with somebody else. Because that's how the members of the Presidium get to know each other, get to rely on each other, and get to trust each other. It also means that if 90% of the time this is what I do as my Legion service, there's a real value in 10% of the time I'm doing something. Because that's where I get to learn the other works of the Presidium. You know, the works, whatever the work is, should never be the exclusive property of one or two members. Partnerships should not have a permanence that is completely inflexible. Now, it may well be that all that regularly we're the two that are working together and this is what we do, and that is completely fine. But it shouldn't be always. It's the two of us, and this is what we do. Because that creates a certain exclusivity and an ownership, both of the relationship between members of the Presidium and an ownership of the work that runs counter to the spirit of the work being assigned. And if it's always the same thing, and I feel entitled to always getting the same thing, I'm not really being assigned anything. Um, so it runs counter to the work being assigned, and it runs counter to the ability of the members of the Presidium to know, trust, and work with one another. Um, so in the reporting, and the reason why there is reporting in the first place, these are the values that are, are running through all of this. That's why at the end of the meeting, what do we have? We have work assignments. And again, on any given week, we may all well know who's going to be doing what job, and that's okay. But it shouldn't be the case every week. And from time to time, it really is good for the president to talk to a couple members. Like, uh, I'd like to see, would you be open to changing up partners for a couple weeks? And again, explaining why. So that the other person gets to know you and gets to know the work. So that you get to experience something else, or that we need a little extra help over here. Um, but it really becomes important because otherwise, again, we lose that ability to allow our lady to keep putting us in order because we're defending our space. And so the work reporting then has a couple of necessary elements to it. Sometimes we fall into the trap in giving the reports of it's all numbers. You know, and uh, there, are, there are some Legion meetings and some council meetings you go to, and all you hear are numbers. This many people, this many medals were given out, this many contacts. That's, none of that is bad, but none of those numbers tells me what happened. A good report is always more than mere numbers. More important than the number of medals that were handed out, is what was going on when you were doing them. For example, I could stand outside the door of the church with miraculous medals and prayer cards, and I could just say good morning and keep handing them out, and I could name that as 250 personal contacts that I've had. But, you know, let's be honest, that is the fittest definition of personal contact that, that there is. On the other hand, it may well be that I sat with somebody for 10 minutes, talked with them through a difficult situation, and in the end gave them a miraculous medal and taught them how to pray with them. Well, if, numerically, that is a smaller thing. But in terms of the spirit of the Apostles of the Legion, there's a depth to that, that the shallow giving out of a large quantity of things doesn't have to it. And again, I am not saying never hand things out. But I am saying that when we give a report, more important than the number is what happened. Who were you with? What did you do? What was the reaction? What was the outcome? Is there, you know, is, is there something particularly good from 
Maybe you did in your Legion service in a given week, maybe you had three or four different encounters and one of them really stood out. You know, it's worth saying, you know, I had these three encounters, this is what we did, and one of them in particular was beautiful. And without telling the whole story, you give a few details. And note how when we give a report that way, it allows the rest of the Presidium in its own way to participate a little bit in what you've done. It becomes more of a shared work and not just a crude statement of, this is what I did because I have to fill in the report. Um, and so the Legion report is really at the service of, again, talking about what we did with the responsibility we were given and how was God working in that. You know, it may be that in my reporting I just say, you know, I had three or four encounters and none of them went well. And I'm not sure why, but this is what was going on. That is an excellent report, honestly. Because it's something that we can think about, we can talk about, and we can work with. But if you just tell me I had these four encounters and, you know, you shrug your shoulders, well, okay, you've made a report. But it doesn't help us understand what happened. And so the Legion, that's why the Legion recognizes sometimes the reports will run long. Not always because there's a lot of reports, but there may be a couple reports that just require a bit more explaining to them. You know, and again, it doesn't have to be an exercise in exhausting ourselves. No one needs to have a story to tell every meeting. But if we go through the course of a month and the reporting from all of the members never has a note of this is what went well, or this is what I experienced, then we're doing something wrong. Either in the work or just how we're talking about it. Um, so again, this is not that I have to make something up, that I have to force myself to find a moment of grace that wasn't apparent. Um, it's really a matter of recognizing that when we do certain things, there are these marvelous moments that happen and they're worth recognizing, they're worth naming. And they're worth naming in part because of how it helps to strengthen the other members of the Presidium. If there's a problem that we ran into, it's worth naming it. Because the next person who goes out might run into the same issue. Um, so again, this is not merely us doing our homework and handing it in for a grade. The reporting, again, is about how we are coming together and working together and being responsible before one another, as well as Our Lady, for what we're all trying to do together. So on a side note, before we move on to the katana, this is another reason why in the long term, let me stress this, because I'm not saying if it's not working this way now, change it right away. In the long term, it is usually a good idea for a presidium to have only a couple works that it does. Not because all the works are bad, but because nobody can do them all and do them coherently and well. You know, a presidium of 10 members who have 10 different works is going to be much less effective than a presidium of 10 members who does two works and does them well with focus. Because you're not dissipating the energy in many directions. There are many works that the Legion can do but any presidium should only be doing a couple. Because that allows its energy and its creativity and its talent to be focused. And in choosing those works, it's really not helpful to begin with a list of what are approved works. The best place to begin is, for example, what does the parish need? What's missing in the parish? Is there some way we could do something about that? Well, maybe the answer is no, but frequently I bet the answer is going to be yes. And note the difference then. Note the difference for your recruitment. It's one thing when somebody comes up and says, you know, I am kind of interested in the Legion Mary. What do you guys do? And the answer is, well, we have a couple people who bring communion to the sick, and so-and-so helps with the baptismal program, and he or she teaches catechism. And the person's in there like, uh, I don't need to be a member of the Legion to do any of those things. Versus, we're spearheading this initiative for the parish. Note the difference. 
you know, there's a sense of direction, a sense of difference, a sense of the Legion is looking to do something that reaches a little bit beyond what the other pastoral outreach is. And again, I want to stress this. I am not saying overturn everything now. I am simply saying that it's important to be conscious of this perspective on Legion works. Um, and you know, this is where having a stronger relationship with a pastor or a spiritual director can be really helpful in terms of discerning some of these things, in terms of asking the question of, if we wanted to change direction, how would we even begin to do that? Okay? So I am not saying recklessly change course. But note the power when the Legion begins to recognize a clear direction, a clear initiative that isn't reducible to what somebody else is doing. And it lends a certain uniqueness and attractiveness to the Legion Apostolate, but it also lends a certain energy to the Legion, and frankly to a pastor or a parish, if they see something begin to happen. Um, you know, because, you know, and, you know, one of the great criticisms is, is, is so much more of the same. We're all tired doing the same tired things, and they might be beautiful things. But the Legion, the Legion wasn't founded simply to go through the motions. And so we want to be careful of that. And again, that's the advantage of work reporting. Because if we are trying something new, that's, well, how's it going? Uh, is, do we need to change course? Is there anything we can approve? And so the work reporting is vital for all of these reasons. And the response to the work reporting is that we all stand up and face our lady. After the work reporting is done in an ordinary meeting, we all stand up and face Our Lady. <coughs> and we do the container. Spiritually, something truly profound is happening in that moment. First and most obviously, the great majority of Legion work involves visits, doesn't it? And even the handbook is somewhat surprised by that because that was never set out to be the primary work of the Legion, but it's really become the work that is associated with the Legion. And what is the Magnificat? It is the great hymn of the visit. How interesting. After doing the visits, after talking about the visits, after making sure we have a sense of understanding what happened in the visit, where the grace of God was moving, where the grace of God was lacking, we stand up in the reality of the visiting we have been doing. To pray. And the heart of that prayer is going to be the great song of the visit. How absolutely remarkable that is. And note that prayer. My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior. That's what you're saying at that point. That's not what Mary's saying at that point. That's what you're saying. After the visit. Just like she said it on the occasion of a visit. It's thanking God for all that happened through the visit. It's asking God's grace on those people we've visited. It's celebrating His goodness that is happening in those lives even before we got there and will continue to happen after we got there. Isn't that marvelous? And if that's all that was happening here, that would be profound. But that's only the tip of the proverbial iceberg. Because chapter 3 of the handbook, what does the Legion say when it talks about the spirit of the Legion? The spirit of the Legion is the spirit of Mary. And what is the great song of Mary's spirit? My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. That is the prayer she says, filled with the Lord and filled with the spirit. That is the prayer she says after the spirit filled Elizabeth at the mere sound of her greeting. It is the prayer that communicates the spirit of Mary. The 
And so what else does a legion do? It drinks refreshment from the well of Mary's spirit after the work of visiting so that it can continue to go forth and do so. And so again, the catena of all the prayers is to be respected. This moment, this moment of drinking in together from the well of Our Lady's Spirit, this moment of celebrating together, thanking and glorifying God together for what we have been able to do together with her. And note again now, this has this element, this very explicit element of participation in what Mary is doing. We stand with her, we sing her song. We visit just as she visits. And the handbook speaks about the legionaries going forth in the spirit of Our Lady. Those who go forth in the spirit of Our Lady, thank God in the spirit of Our Lady. Those who will go forth again in the spirit of Our Lady, drink deeply of the spirit of Our Lady. And it is this prayer that the legion says every single day. The one prayer that every legionary says every day. Not the rosary. Not the rosary. The katana. It is the prayer of the legion. To not understand this prayer, to not know this prayer, is to miss something intrinsic to the spirit of the legion. So let's linger on this prayer a little longer. Because it begins with a question. You ever think about that? The prayer begins with a question. Who is this? Who is she? But note the kind of question, note the tone of the question. It's the question of eyes swelling in wonder at seeing something undescribably undescribably remarkable. There's a person who draws near and the question is, who could be so wondrous as this? Who is it possible that comes forth as the morning rising? Who, who truly could be beauteous as the moon? Splendid like the sun. When was the last time you really thought about Mary that way? Here's the Legion's Mariology in miniature right here. You, know, you want to deepen your devotion to Mary? Just reflect on this question. Imagine seeing somebody like the morning light breaking after a long night. And that's who I'm talking about. Like the moon resplendent with the reflected light of the sun pouring it out through the dark. And yet splendid and mighty with the burning light of the sun itself. Boy, it's a not exactly lovely lady dressed in blue, is it? Note how muscular the imagery is. Note how compelling it is. Terrible as an Achi is. An army said in battle array. Who is this? And the beautiful thing about the prayer is as soon as we ask the question, we get the answer. And Mary answers it. Who is this? My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. That's who this is. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior. That's who this is. How absolutely wonderful that is. Every day, the Legion pauses in this moment of wondrous contemplation. Every day it asks the question and receives that answer. But then as you finish the container, you go back to the question. Who is this? And the same wonderment is still there having heard the answer and is answered a second time. That's the glorious thing about the way the katana is put together. 
Who is this? So the second answer is, O Mary conceived without sin, pray for us who have recourse to you. She is the sinless virgin, the immaculate conception, whom I can trust to call upon in my need. That is who this is. But know what's implied in all of that. If she goes forth like a bannered army, how does that happen? <coughs> Except by her legion going forth into the world. And note then too how the legion sees itself going forth in some way as a manifestation of our lady's presence. Not as Our Lady, but as a way that her touch reaches the world. As a way that that morning light, that splendor of the moon, that radiance of the sun, breaks upon the world. What an absolutely beautiful prayer that is. This prayer is the heart of the meeting. It's the hinge on which the meeting turns. It's the climax of the meeting. It's the physical climax of the meeting, if you think about it. How does the meeting begin? We're on our knees. When we leave our knees, we sit down. For the katana, we stand. And after the katana, we sit. If the meeting is like a mountain, the katana is the summit. It's the high point. It's the spiritual high point. It is the physical high point. And it's the part of the meeting that is echoed in the prayer of every Legion member every day. Because the Legion member who will be about visiting during the week will pray the prayer of the visit all week long. And it's that prayer that gathers the Legion back again to the meeting. But now, how in a sense the meeting never fully ends because it has that echo of the katana running through the week. And it's after we sit down from that mystical height of the katana that the alakutsio is given. The alakutsio is not merely a catechetical teaching. It's not merely a spiritual exhortation. It is not merely a discussion of the handbook. It may involve any or all of those things. But the hand, the Yalakutsio is a spiritual instruction drawing from the wellspring of the life of the Legion for the upbuilding of the Legionaries. Note the difference. It's not handbook study, although it might explain some element of the handbook. It's not a catechetical teaching, although it might start from some issue of the faith that we need to talk about. But it's not a random conference on some aspect of Our Lady. It's not a random reflection on the daily readings. It must be connected to the life and the mission and the spirit of the Legion. This is really important. Um, it should be solid. It shouldn't be so brief that if you blink, you miss it. But it's also not a homily. You know, so somewhere in that five to seven minute range is the generally acknowledged sweet spot. Full disclosure, I often go 10 or 12. Um, but uh, but the, the idea being that what, what it must be, what it must be is something that touches upon the life of the Legion for the spiritual development of the Legionaries. So if it's, a, if it's a discussion about authority in the Legion or the structure of the Legion, it has to be at the service of what does that mean for us here and spiritually what's the take-home point. Not merely the handbook says this and this is how it works. 
That's not a bad teaching, but that can be done later. Um, and so note that the alacutio flows out of the prayer of the katena and is connected to it. Because we don't close with the sign of the cross until after the alacutio is done. And so it's part of that movement. As we settle back into our chairs, there then is a moment where the presidium listens together ideally in the presence of a director who can give some of that ecclesiastical guidance that is mentioned in terms of the object of the legion. But again, note, um, the, the alacuncio, a well-selected alacuncio, is one that is going to help the legionaries live their legion commitment. That's what it's really at the service of. Sometimes that's by simply consoling and inspiring. Sometimes that's by providing concrete instruction. Sometimes it's a matter of clarifying some things that have been ambiguous for everybody. Okay, so it could be any of those things as long as that thing is at the service of enabling the Legion members to more effectively live the spirit of the Legion. But it's not something of, we'll talk about something of general interest for the Alacuzio. So it's not a discussion of current events. It's not a discussion of some legitimate area of theology that isn't directly connected to what we're doing. That can all come later. In fact, the back part of the meeting has plenty of space for that. Because that's the interesting thing. Coming out of the Alacuzio, one comes to the back part of the meeting. And the handbook is marvelously silent about the back part of the meeting. All those forms you have to tell you what to do after the alacuzio, some of that is not from the handbook. Some of that is just long-standing custom. It's a healthy recommendation, and it's not bad. But it's also not required. The back part of the meeting is flexible. The only thing that has to happen are work assignments, the Legion prayers, and if work reports need to continue, then they continue on the back side of the meeting. And so note, the back side of the meeting, after the Alicuzio, could be for handbook study. The back side of the meeting could be for planning an upcoming activity. The back side of the meeting could be we need to revisit some things that have just come up over the last several meetings. The back side of the meeting has a considerable amount of flexibility. It's, you could do a book study on the back side of the meeting. Um, and, um, you know, so it's, there are a number of options. And so what we don't want to do is get slavishly devoted to a form on that back side and lose the flexibility. We also shouldn't be so random that it's different every time. There's a value in consistency. But, you know, there may be a desire, where they're at the recommendation of the spiritual director, that maybe the Presidium takes some time working with a spiritual resource. And so everybody gets a copy of the resource, and over five or six weeks are going to read through it. You know, and so for five or six weeks in the back part of the meeting, there's 15, 20 minutes set aside to talk about what we've read. Um, you know, and again, when the handbook talks about doing a book study that way, it also it insists there, too, that everybody has to say something. Um, but again, the, but the, okay, there the issue is there are ways to build in a bit of focused study, a bit of focused work, and, you know, and that can be particular to each presidium, and it can be particular depending on where we are in the year in terms of what we're doing activity-wise. And so note, though, as for as rigid as the meeting is, as fixed as the system is up to a certain point, it then opens into a flexible space. And in that flexible space, a lot of the ordinary business that we find ourselves frustrated, well, we can't get to this, we can't get to that, can actually happen if we're focused and we're organized with it. Um, and that, but that's the key, if we're focused and organized with it. Now again, nothing in the meeting should overwhelm the work reports. But, um, but it's, it's a wonderful part of the system that we do that. And then however we come out of that busy part of the backside of the meeting, we move into work assignments. 
And again, note it's work assignments. The protocol is the president assigns the works to the members, even if it's the same works every week. Um, and why? We never want to lose sight of that dimension of I receive the work. I don't take the work. I'm trusted with the work. I'm not the owner of the work because the owner is Our Lady. And what I do, I do because she's trusted me with it. Then we get back on our knees again. So once the work assignments are given, the date of the next meeting is announced, we get on our knees at that moment of looking to go out before we go out. We kneel. And together, before we go out, we pray for a sharing in Our Lady's faith. And so note, the legion that gathers in her name, the legion that drinks in her spirit in praying the katana, petitions heaven for a sharing in her faith. So that it goes forth in her faith. What a marvelous, what a marvelous movement. And so then if the spiritual director is present, he rises and imparts the blessing. And then the members rise and the meeting is over. But we arrive on our feet and we get on our knees. We walk into the meeting and we kneel. And then we kneel at the end of the meeting before we walk out. Bookended by the kneeling and that double transition from walking to kneeling and then from kneeling to walking. And in the middle, that gloriously beautiful summit that we climb together, the Katana of Our Lady, where on the one hand, we go down and drink deeply of the well of her spirit, but on the other hand, we lift our hearts high to the glory and praise of Almighty God. That having been said, I would be remiss if I didn't point out one more spiritual aspect of the Katana. Legion members go out, and the great virtue of the Legion is generosity in the service of the Queen. And if we're serving the Queen, it means we do things for the Queen. St. Louis Marie de Montfort, reflecting on this, speaks about the absolute importance of doing things for Mary, so that they will be done more fully for Christ and for God. And one could ask the question of, how exactly does that work, that if I do something for Mary, I'm doing it more fully for God? Why can't I just do it for God in the first place and get it over with? As, you know, it's, it's a fair and it's an understandable question. Well, Father de Montfort will insist. If you want to do it truly for God, do it for Mary. And it works like this. If I go out and do something for God, what does God get? Must be blunt. He gets what I give him. That's not a lot. It's not nothing, but it is not a lot. He gets my little generosity, my little service, my little song of, act, of thanksgiving, which is attitude. It's not nothing, but it's not much. Unless I'm hopelessly arrogant. On the other hand, if I do something for Mary, what happens? She's grateful. She's grateful that because of all that God has done for me through her, I do something for her. And she receives that little thing that I gave her. And she looks up to heaven. And she thanks God. And what does God get then? A lot more than I was offering. 
he still gets what I give, but he gets more in addition to it because she multiplies its goodness with her praise and her gratitude. I give something to her, and what happens? My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. Note the power of the container. It's a reminder of that. In our legion service, we do our small favor for the Lord. And yet, united with Mary, a greater song of praise and a greater act of thanksgiving and glory rises to heaven. Because we did it for her. And we did it with her. She amplifies the little goodness we bring to the table. She amplifies the small works that we do. That's why quantity is not the big thing. That's why trying to do impressive works is not the big thing. It's trying to do the right works. Trying to do them well. And that simple faithfulness that shows up makes a difference. Not because we bring so much or give so much. 